pop quiz hot shot. Clay, let's see how far you've come on your uh, Star Trek journey. I know we've talked about this before. Oh, I, you, I can't wait to disappoint a lot of people. <laughs> you have five seconds. Uh, what are the founding members of this, the Federation? <laughs> I don't know. No idea. No, uh, you, you, humans. I'll give you humans. <laughs> humans, Vulcans, uh, Pajorans, uh, and the uh, Squeelex. I would have thought Andorians was sitting there for you. You could have gone. Yeah, I, I figured that was too obvious, though. <laughs> Vulcans, humans, Andorians, and the Tellarites, who we haven't heard yet. Are, but- are Andorians are they good guys by the time you get to TOS? They are good guys. They're only see the the Andor- we'll we'll get into this more probably it would be a good way to like open up the main thing of it. But the Andorians are kind of a funny species here where um they're in TOS and I think they're only in two episodes and they are not major characters neither. They're they're basically borderline background extras in it. Mm. Um they're mostly known for the being in the episode where you meet Sarek for the first time because he is at like a delegation of Federation members and the Andorians are one of them that are there. Mm-hmm. Uh, but we'll get into it. Let's take a break. We'll play a quote from the episode and then we'll come back and we'll break down the Andorian incident. They don't even know we're coming? It wasn't possible to hail them. The monks consider technology a distraction from their spiritual pursuits. I don't like dropping in on people unannounced. It won't be a problem as long as we observe the proper protocols. When we arrive, we'll be greeted by a Vulcan elder. You should not speak to him or any member of the order unless spoken to first. If they appear to be meditating, do not approach them or attempt to make conversation. Also, maintain quiet at all times and do not touch or disturb any artifacts, relics, or ornamentation. If we arrive at their time of communal colonar, it's likely we'll be turned away. At the conclusion of our visit, we'll be offered the Stone of Jaka as a gesture of salutation. Accept it. Then bow slightly and observe a respectful silence for approximately five seconds. Okay, so the Andorian Incident is the seventh episode of the first season. It aired on October 31st, 2001. Teleplay goes to Fred Decker. Story credit goes to Rick Berman, Brandon Braga, and Fred Decker. Directed by Roxanne Dawson. The in-universe date is the 19th of June, 2151. In this episode, Enterprise visits a Vulcan monastery only to find that it is in the midst of being taken over by the Andorians. So the, uh, yeah, the Andorians, Clay, were basically, uh, they were more of a canon importance, like like in the uh, supplemental stuff that's not in the show. So they were considered to be founding members of the Federation before this point in Star Trek, but they've never been said to be that up to this Ah, point. Ah, I see. So... Uh Go ahead. Yeah, I was I was just gonna say, yeah, I uh, you, you mentioned that they in the original series they were kind of background. They feel like they are background cat, like they're the silliest looking design I think in all of Star Trek. Yeah, if Berman didn't like the Berman <clears throat> during his era. He didn't want Andorians because he didn't like the antenna. He thought that it just didn't well, fit in with the show, and they were they were. Uh, the Andorians are mentioned a lot. They've been mentioned in DS Nine and everything, but you rarely see them, if at all. He's he's kind of not wrong. Like it, it does feel like a relic of '60s sci-fi. Mm-hmm. It feels very. Uh, they feel very B movie sci-fi. But I mean, they they've come they a long way the, from toilet paper rolls painted blue that were painted on these stuck on people's heads. You know, yeah. like the, the antenna oh, definitely. move in this one. Yeah, yeah. But but like they they went out of their way to reconceptualize the Klingons. I don't know why they didn't just go. Eh, yeah, maybe we, maybe we we tweak these guys a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and as such, like not much is known about the Andorians besides the fact that they're just considered that little trivia thing I mentioned at the beginning. They're considered to be a founding member, but they won't get, they won't officially canonize that until later in Enterprise. So uh, this is like the first real introduction that we have to them in any sense of the word. And uh, the other thing that it does is it brings back Jeffrey Combs as Shran, who is going to be a recurring character, who's the leader of this group of Andorians. But what did you think of this episode? Um. I thought it was pretty, I, you know, I don't know. I, I thought it was fine. Um, it's voted number two fan favorite of Enterprise. Really? On a, on a okay. UPN online poll. Just to give you, this is a very highly regarded episode, uh, p- particularly for Enterprise, I think. So I don't know if that spells doom <laughs> and gloom for you going forward, but people hmm. tend to really like this one. I'm more of your opinion that it's kind of middling. Um, 
it's not my favorite of the episodes that we've seen so far. I think that yeah. it's, I think it's a very stock hostage situation that and like it's one of those episodes that's saved by the last five minutes and only because it sort of brings up an interesting idea that the episode itself is not really about right i thought the ending was really strange it seemed like a really abrupt way to end it um do you like the shot of <laughs> arch is just like well we made a friend and then smash cut to the shuttle flying off as the credits roll yeah <laughs> <laughs> it, it is so it's a very abrupt ending and it's i mean it's it's just the fact that like you What's interesting about it, right, is that it's kind of a big development that the episode runs out of time to explain. Like the, yeah. the humans have basically, if not betrayed, they've sort of turned their backs on the only friend that they have in space to this point, which is the Vulcans. And mm-hmm. they sold them out to a group of fairly unlikable aliens at this point who were right about what they were doing. And so it's this interesting thing of Archer doing kind of the right thing in a very like golden rule, uh, human inspirational kind of way. But it's another strange Archer decision that we have to assume will pan out because they all get together and become friends in the Federation. But at this time, it just seems like a, a uh, an interesting choice on Archer's part to be like, you know what? These Vulcans are wrong for what they do. And here's all their information on their secret base. I will give it to you. I mean, to be fair, uh, he makes a quite a big presumption of what they, that place could just be where they make all of their candy. Mm-hmm. It could be a candy factory. Yeah, Willy Wonka. He, he, yeah, so he, he kind of makes a uh, no, but the, uh, it would be illogical uh, to not have a candy factory in your monastery. Yeah, I know. I mean, what, what else are you going to do down there? You just make uh, uh, like how the it's the it's the Vulcan uh, equivalent of the Trappist monks who just yep. make beer all the time. Yep. Um, yeah, it's it it feels weird because it comes in the last like yeah, like you said, five minutes, probably even less of the episode, and it just is not really addressed. And it's also not really like it's not there's no discussion throughout the episode, like leading up to that reveal. It's it's not like uh um very little There's, triple-headed monster of humans talking to Andorians, talking to Vulcans in this episode, which I think is the biggest problem with it. Yeah, yeah. it becomes like once once they get down there and once the Andorians capture them, it becomes very much, like you said, a stock hostage thing where the Andorians are the bad guys, the Vulcans are the good guys, and they have to try and figure out how to get out of it. And I, I mean, I appreciate the uh, attempt at sort of like flipping that on its head at the end but i don't really think that there's enough discussion of 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 what's going on between everybody for that to really land the way i think they wanted to at least for me anyway yeah no i i think that the biggest problem with this is that the andorians are barely developed as anything and there's no if if you're going to have this episode where it's basically the three different species there's a lot more characters than three characters but if you have that sort of um the vulcan elder shran and then archer as the three representatives of the three species they don't have a scene where those three talk to each other really it's the yeah the vulcans explain to the humans what the andorians are up to the andorians don't really explain anything outside of the fact that they're looking for something and th- they don't trust the vulcans but they're setting them up to be the Andorians and the Vulcans are sort of opposites of each other, and the humans have to act as mediators, which is kind of like um, predicting what the Federation would be in a way, right? Like you have Mm -hmm. to come up with a way that these three very different species are going to get along with each other. And I don't think this does a very good job of showing how that would really work outside of them sort of double-crossing each other and giving information to the other. There's no coming to terms or a meeting of the minds between the three of them, which is a little bit fascinating. It's early, and they have a long way to go, but it's a weird way to start it off, I guess. Yeah, I don't think they need to, like, fix the problem or anything. Right. Fix the... uh, Be best friends, yeah. Yeah, it is just... It is kind of weird to me that... I don't know. Uh, it's just the 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 way that the action plays out and and the drama plays out in the episode. You don't really feel like that's kind of what it's driving to at the end. Um. So when they hit you with it, it it feels very much out of left field. Like it, they the Andorians, they, there was no um, <laughs> there was no real like, <clears throat> uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, 
light side to what the Andorians were doing. They were pre, pre being presented as pretty awful people. Yep. And so, like, even at the end, when when you discover that this underground base exists, the Andorians are still taking hostages and beating the shit out of people. Yep. You know, it's it's just a str- it's very strange for Archer to be so uh, um, what's the word uh, betrayed by by these uh, the Vulcans on this planet that he would just hand over all this inf- secret information to them. Yes, he doesn't know. He does. None of us, the viewer <laughs> or Archer or the Vulcans, don't know what the Andorians are going to do with this information. He doesn't this. even know what the information is. Yeah, yeah. He just doesn't even scan. bother to like look at it. He just takes a scan and he hands it over to them. He could have given them like the nuclear codes yeah. or something. Yep. Yep. Which but is it's it's and that's a it's an interesting choice on Archer's part. It's just, it it fits with like do you think I think it's another thing of the show doesn't really seem to realize what Archer's doing here. It's just kind of assuming that because we know how this works out, Archer doing what he does here must be the right thing going forward. Like yeah. it's a very trusting attitude, especially that, when not to interrupt, but the the thing about the Vulcans here is that Archer has learned through this that the Vulcans are also lying to him. So why mm. does he just trust the Andorians? It's like he it would be one thing if he just kind of trusted everybody and everybody had the good side to them. But in this episode, he's directly dealing with people who have been lying to him. So why does he trust these other guys immediately? Yeah, I mean, like if it were up to me uh, in that last sequence, obviously you can't do this because the technology is different in this episode but once they instead of scanning the thing i would have just had them like bust in there archer register what's going on shoot every shoot the andorians a look shoot every uh to paul and the vulcans a look and then like uh communicate up to enterprise and say enterprise three to beam out and then they just leave yeah (laughs) and And they leave all the andorians and and the vulcans together. yeah and leave the andorians and the vulcans to deal with it themselves yeah because because i it's it does continue down this weird path of and I mean I guess it's just his character, but it, it is interesting to look at in hindsight, um, where he is very much like a uh, for 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 lack for lack of a better term, he's like a uh, uh, a stupid American character. Yeah. yeah, you know where he's like every decision that he makes is the right one, even if it's not the right one. Like even at the beginning when when. The, he's like, hey, this planet looks cool. And T'Pol's like, actually, it's a very sacred site that they don't really like people going there. He's like, wow. I mean, we're not going to touch anything. <laughs> yeah. Go, uh, this, this bitch keeps talking to me. It's like, God damn, is she ever going to shut up about their sacred yeah, rituals? Yeah, I mean, it's a sacred temple no one's been in a thousand years. But I mean, we can just stick our heads in, right? <laughs> His logic of looking at the room is some Andorians have already looked like, at it, so I should be able to look at it, too. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Where he's like, yeah, people have already seen it. You know, who gives a shit if somebody else sees it? It's very but early like, 2000s American foreign policy, sort of. Like, it's, right. it's very reflective of that era, yeah. Which is which is again interesting to look at in hindsight, um, and I'm you know I, I I have I have inferred from comments um, uh, across our different uh, uh, systems here that uh, I will there will be a change that reflects what has happened in the world as the show is going on. Yep. But uh, it is it is pretty interesting, and I do continue to really like to Paul and how she deals with them because uh, 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 is it. Yeah, uh, one of the I think the Andorians ask her what their mission is, and she's like to seek out strange new worlds that the humans think are new. Like yeah. she's very passive aggressive about how fucking dumb she thinks this all is. <laughs> <laughs> They've already got star charts. They've already made all the charts. They don't need to be. Yeah, I, I mean it's a, it's, it's like a good, it's a good question. It's like, to you. oh god, <laughs> sorry, I was just gonna say it's like uh, when I was when I was younger and I f- was first discovering like uh, you know classic rock music. I would listen to it all the time. I would always ride in the car. Whatever I was riding in the car with my dad, I would always put on, you know, whatever channel. And I'd be like, oh, man, isn't this, don't you love this song? And he's like, Clay, I've been listening to this Eddie Money song for 30 years. Yeah. This is not new to me. And it's like not something that you recognize at the time. And then, like, later on, as I was older, I had younger cousins who would do the same thing. And I'd be like, yeah, I I get it. I, I know. Yeah. It's, been there, it's done cool. that. Yeah. And it, it, that's the vibe that I get from from T'Pol, which I think is is a very very interesting fun vibe. The um, do you think that the what do you think of the way the Vulcans are portrayed with their exploration stuff? They, 
I, I kind of agree with the sentiment that it's a little bit odd how little the Vulcans seem interested in exploring, although I think you could justify it by just saying that they're they're more interested in sort of a logical, rational way of going about finding things as opposed to the humans who are content to sort of zip around all over the place to see what's going on in different mm-hmm. spots. Um, but the Vulcans do seem, to Paul in particular, seems like very disinterested in learning about new things, which seems antithetical. And I guess they have that opening scene here where Phlox has to remind her that it's infinite diversity and infinite combinations is like their motto. Mm. So why isn't she on board with all this stuff? And maybe it's just a T'Pol characterization, but I get the sense from the Vulcans that they're the same way too. No, that's what it is. It's the scene with with Phlox where she says that thing. That, yeah, I, I like that scene a lot, actually. Steals her salary. Um, Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's uh, uh, it's interesting. I've I've found the the um, depiction of the Vulcans in general to be um, kind of surprising because they are this episode in uh, just kind of backs up that they're they're really giving them sort of a sneaky kind of edge that they've never had before and yeah. uh, an untrustworthy edge. And I'm not. It's I'm not totally sure what the end game for that is other than to have Archer not trust them. Um, but I guess it's more interesting than just having them be pals. Yeah, I I think it makes sense for early Vulcan, early in the Federation-Vulcan relationship. I think this makes sense for them to be this way because I do, the Vulcans seeing themselves as superior does make sense to me. Like I, I think that they would be that kind of an arrogant race with what they're doing where they mm-hmm. can't relate to the Andorians and the, and the humans because they're too emotional and too flippant about everything. And I think also I thought I thought they were supposed to not lie. The Vulcans? Yeah. Yeah, Don't Spock they probably a- has a line about that. But again, this is all before that. Maybe they come up with something, I guess you could you could say is that Yeah, cuz I I feel like uh uh <clears throat> is it Star Trek 6, I think, mm-hmm. where uh Kim Cattrall or or maybe it's Savick, maybe it's Star Trek 2, uh calls him on lying and he's like, "I did not lie. I simply exaggerated." Or something like yeah, that. Yeah. Yeah. Um so it's it's weird that they have this like completely secret underground base that they're just uh, uh, explicitly lying to everybody about. <laughs> <laughs> I don't I don't mind them lying because I don't think nah, that there's fine. I don't care. Yeah, I don't think there's anything wrong with I guess the honesty thing is strange because you could see reasons why it would be rational to lie to people like that. Like you uh, there seems to be a lot of disadvantage to telling the truth all the time that if you could take advantage of that, but I, I don't really know. The the main thing that they what I do like about this episode, and they only briefly get into it, is that they, I think they're doing a good job of deconstructing the Vulcans into something that is not the superior race that the TOS episodes treated them as. Like TOS was mm-hmm. very reverential of the Vulcans, and they, I think Roddenberry, if he could have been a Vulcan, would want to be a Vulcan. I think that yeah. he sees it as like the epitome of what uh, we should strive towards. And here, it's the thing we've talked about before, like the the Vulcans are pacifist to a, to their detriment here, where mm. they, they refuse to sort of fight back and defend themselves. And it uh, and it comes to the cost of, this is not the first time the Endorians have done that. The Endorians just sort of come on to their monastery and just smash shit whenever they want to. And the Vulcans just wait around until they get bored and they leave. And I do like the inner conflict there of Archer's like, why are you letting them just walk all over you? Like, what's wrong mm. with you? Like, why don't you fight back? And I think that, it, I think it's, that's the one thing in this episode that I like and that it shows the difference between the species, but it's only constrained really to that one scene, which is the, kind of the impetus for Archer to stick up for everybody and go into scene number 57 where he gets the shit kicked out of him and he, he for some <laughs> reason drops the figurine down the cave when you could just go into that tunnel and look out the hole to, <laughs> <where you, laughs> to see where you are. So I don't really understand yeah, the point of that. Yeah, that was kind of weird. Yeah, it's, it's strange. Yeah, and you know uh, the pacifist to a fault thing is is kind of weird too because ultimately the the Vulcan pulls a gun on Archer and is like I'm I will kill this man if you don't get out of here or something. Yeah. So it's like, yeah, it's uh it's an interesting line that they're riding with them. Um, and I guess I I guess that's sort of the 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 problem that I have overall with the episode is that yeah it just doesn't feel like that ending is is earned thematically or like it doesn't feel like you're driving towards that and I get that it's kind of a surprise but I just don't think enough of the episode is about I don't mean like explicitly about that but like it's not about what that means right for it to really land with me right and 
I think that you know that the episodes are very episodic at this point, right? So it's not like this yeah. is going to feed into the next episode where we deal with the repercussions of what this mm-hmm. means. It is just an ending that's supposed to be kind of a shocking thing to you. And yeah, I don't know. It's it's not structured in a way where you, you it's another I think we brought this up in another episode where you don't get you don't get enough scenes of Archer talking to the Vulcans, really. Like to Paul is right. a stand in for that, but to Paul is in this kind of tough position where she is subordinate to Archer and can't really fight back against him. Right. Like she's not the She's not the Vulcan council that is kind of like, you idiots are doing the wrong thing. Like, listen to us. And so her pushback is not nearly as effective as when Archer's talking to the like the monk leader here on this planet. But I just think that they don't play up that stuff enough. And kind of the problem, like this kind of feeds into the Endorian stuff, which is uh, Combs is back as Shran, who's a recurring character. He's on like seven or eight more episodes, I think, after this. Um People really like Shran. I haven't seen the mm-hmm. entire series, so I can only base it on the couple of appearances that I know that he's from. I don't think it's the best Combs role. And I think mm. that the main reason for that is that the it, it also ties into the problem with the Endorians in general and the, how they're portrayed here, is that he's... When you have Combs in a role like this, and we've talked about it before, you need to do about a little bit of like a fun, campy twist on a character. Um, right. And Shran here is just a generic thug character. Yes. And yeah. he, he doesn't really have, Combs doesn't really have space to shine. He's not, it's not that he's bad. He's very good at it and he's a good actor. But he's not the playfulness of Wayun. There's like mm. this sort of like fun factor to Wayun. There's nothing fun about Shran really. And he just comes across as a generic thug who hits people with his gun and sort of yells at people. And that's not really Combs at his best. And I think that it's a weakness that spreads across the entire Andorian uh portrayal here where they're kind of boring and kind of stock yeah i'm for i would also first like to say i'm really happy that you said wayun because as you were talking about him i was racking my brain for that <laughs> character's <remember>. name <laughs> and i could not remember what the hell it was so thank you wayun's my favorite uh, combs character i, I love Wayun. Yeah. yeah and I, you know i, I the, uh, the reason i was i was searching for the name is because i was going to say with wayun i feel like right from the get-go wayun is captivating as a character because he's got more of that uh jeffrey combs uh camp to him and i don't mean it's 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 i guess camp is the best word but he's like he's got he's got something for for combs to kind of like grab on he's a little exaggerated he's a slightly exaggerated character yeah but on top of that he's not only a slightly exaggerated but he's got like a thing he's got a character to him uh, which of course you, that you get more of as they bring him back, but like even in his first appearance, if I remember, when he's just the uh, Vorta, right? Yep, he's just a, he's just yeah, a bureaucrat, basically. Like that's, I was, yeah. I was circle around a V word, and I couldn't remember if it what it was, but yeah. it's Vorta, <laughs> he's a Vorta species name. Yep. There we go. Yep. Yeah, but he's got like he has a role to play in this. You know, he's a piece of the story puzzle that they're playing, that they're telling. Whereas this one, he's just sort of there. Um, and yeah, he is kind of just like a, a, a thug who doesn't really have anything interesting about him. You could have, anybody could have played that role and it would have, you know, I, I, I wouldn't say after watching this man, I wish that, I wish Andorian number one came back for the next episode. Yeah. I don't even know if they call him his name in this. That's kind of, yeah, it would be like, I, if you weren't aware it was, it's almost such a subdued performance from him that you don't even recognize that it's him, which is interesting because mm-hmm. in the other other roles that you see him, even through heavy makeup, you're like, oh, it's Jeffrey Combs. But here, he, he doesn't really convey that too much. Yeah, it's funny. I actually, I, I was feeling, as I was watching it, I was seeing Andorians, but I was, in my mind, I was seeing Cardassians. Because oh, really? they seem, yeah. Because they, I feel like they play them kind of the same way as they play the Cardassians generally, mm-hmm. where they're a little bit arch and they're kind of creepy, uh, and they don't really have that much of a. Uh, I'm talking, I'm talking like generic Cardassians. I don't mean like the uh, uh, Guldacot right. or uh, yeah. or uh, Garrick or anything like Background that. Background guards on a Cardassian episode. Yeah, or like, but like the other guy, uh, the guy who was being creepy with T'Pol, For a second, I actually thought it was. The guy who plays, uh, oh god, who's the other, the, the other Cardassian in DS Nine? Main... Not Garrick. Yeah. Not Garrick. The the one who turned uh, Damar. Damar, yes. 
for a sec for half a second I thought it was that guy because he f- it felt like a similar kind of performance. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously it's not, but like, I, I, I just kept thinking about the Cardassians more than anything else, because I guess it's the most recent, uh, other species I'm, I'm used to seeing, but it was, they just didn't really stand out to me as, as being anything, uh, particularly, uh, different or noteworthy. Yeah. They're just sort of militaristic. Um, they're short, I guess is their defining thing. Like all the Endorians are very (laughs) short. Um, that's really it. Other than that, like. Even when Reed is like, I've been reading the pages and pages about the Andorians. They're blue skinned and they like to fight. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's it's not like they've got a story bible about these guys at this point. I don't I don't think. Yeah. Are they are they, are they reading like the uh, uh, the sh- the shorthand manual that you get from like the when you when you go to a, a joke store and mm-hmm. it's like everything you need to know about the Irish. <laughs> Apparently, Never fails. they love beer. Uh, outside of that, I don't, I don't really like, I, I think this is a fine, decently done episode that has a few, uh, kernels, kernels in it. I think that it's one of those things where it's one of those script ideas that they're like, we're going to have a hostage situation. Arch is going to be there. Uh, and then you, once you start fleshing that out they're they're probably like running 10 minutes short or something. I feel a lot of scenes are kind of redundant in this. Like Archer must get his mm. ass kicked in about seven different scenes. Like it just, <laughs> yeah, it he, just endlessly goes on and on. Yeah. He definitely has some sort of brain damage by the end of this episode. <laughs> and, and, you know, I hey, think, you know, sorry, go ahead. Well, the, just the, the scene where he throws the figurine down the tunnel, as far as I can tell that, that, scene only exists because they needed to add time. I, I really don't understand what they accomplished by doing that because it it repeats the fact that he gets his ass kicked as they're looking for information and he does something that does not illuminate anything to anybody. Like there's no right. he doesn't he doesn't do anything that beyond link the fact that those holes are that statue, which you could easily just go up and look out the hole and see that. Mm-hmm. He, he doesn't add mm-hmm. anything to that uh, that knowledge. Yeah, I think there's a few uh, story logic problems like that in in this episode. The the other chief among them is when they beam down, they beam down Malcolm and the other guys, or and the two other guys from Enterprise. They bring a duffel bag full of guns. Yeah, <laughs> and Malcolm and the other guys bring the duffel bag full of guns down into the into the tunnel with them instead of handing them out. They don't hand them out until after they blow through the wall and 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 whatever. And it's like, well, if you handed those guns out first, they got to run into the tunnel, though, right? Isn't that the in- implication that because the Andorians detected them beaming in, they had to run away quick? Yeah, but you got you got a duffel bag full of guns. You can hand out some guns before you run into the tunnel, or or you know, it, it just it's seems, only four it Andorians seems, too. Yeah, yeah, it seems strange to me that. Y- you uh, uh, you send your guys down there with weapons and then you can't they are then artificially uh prevented from giving those guns out until it it benefits the plot yeah sort of um that thing the uh uh, the bit with the throwing the the figurine down the hole seemed kind of weird and yeah I i don't know what information you're getting out of that that and it's like it's that's an interesting one too because it's like I can see the rationale of that scene being, all right, we need to get this information across. What's the most interesting way we can do it? So, all right, we'll have Archer do this thing with the figurine. But ultimately, it's not an interesting scene. He's no. like you said, it's not it's not illuminating anything about that passageway and it's not you're not you're also not getting any new information about the Andorians or anything like that. It's yep. just him getting beaten up and saying a bunch of nonsense. So he can throw that thing down the down the hole, <laughs> which, you know, again, maybe not the best captain in the world. Yeah, yeah, it's, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I really don't understand what the point of that is. It, it's, it's just a poorly uh, connected scene to the rest of it. I, I, I think that the. The the bones like the the area that you should be filling with interesting discussion is not really that. And the, the scene that maybe is the one that I like the most is the one where uh, they're trying to sleep at night and it's Archer to Paul and the Vulcans and it's cold and mm-hmm. they're trying to share the blanket. That scene has the kind of stuff that I wanted more of, of those scenes to have, which is not just kind of like this run and gun action thing, but it's more of a Archer arguing with to Paul about why each of the each of their respective species outlook is wrong on the situation. Mm. 
and it doesn't have nearly enough of that, and it doesn't have any Andorian influence on that. So you don't get that, yeah. this third leg sort of approach to it. And it's just kind of, I think this episode is fine. I just like if you if if people are saying that this is like the tops of Enterprise, I kind of have a problem with that. And I don't know <laughs> if that's just because it's such a novel thing of the Andorians are so important and have been for so long that this being the first time that Starfleet meets them means that it's an important episode if it's not a good mm. episode at least. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like the show um continues to do those smaller moment conversations really well like those seems to be those to me have been the highlight of every episode is when they get a minute to kind of reflect on stuff and have like a uh opposing viewpoint conversation um it's the larger plot and or action stuff that they haven't really figured out how to do really satisfyingly yet it just it all feels kind of kind of stock yeah um I was just thinking, like the instead of having that scene where, like, if if the punchline to this episode, for lack of a better term, is finding the uh, uh, underground arcade and Archer realizing that he's been lied to by the Vulcans, I wish they had done something instead of that. Instead of throwing that, having Archer get beaten up and throwing that figurine down the hole, if they had done something like sent Trip up to look to check it out and while he's up there he sees the andorians talking about something that gives him information that maybe the vulcans are are legitimately are pulling one over on them yes and so he brings that back to archer and archer's like no come on it's the these guys are bad guys they're obviously out of their minds you don't know what, you know what you're talking about and so then when it is revealed at the end archer's his feeling of, de- of being deceived is that much much stronger because he has gone to bat so hard uh, for the Vulcans and believing that they are not lying to him. I, I um, which I guess you could say he got the crap beat out of him twice. That's going to bat pretty hard, but that doesn't feel like that's just it's going that's going to bat in a very kind of stock action way. It yeah. doesn't it doesn't have any resonance. Yeah, you might not have noticed it. I noticed it because I'm rewatching this. Um, they actually kind of foreshadow that the Vulcans are lying a little bit. There's a, when they show up and I think it's after the scene where Archer gets beat up the first time and he's talking to the Vulcan elder and they're talking about, um, they don't have any technology, but then he says, he says, he says like we have this transponder that's very old and they're like, you don't you shouldn't have any technology. They, the direction frames that in a way that when they tell him that Archer kind of raises his eyebrow at him a little Mm. bit and I think they're I think they're trying to hint at there that something kooky is going on. But to have Archer react in that way almost gives Archer this kind of credit that he doesn't deserve at that point mm-hmm. because he hasn't seen mm-hmm. it. He hasn't he hasn't realized anything at that point. And it's just a it almost feels like they tacked it on just to make it seem like they knew what they were doing from the start. And this is, you know, it's a better script because we understand from the very beginning of it that things like this are happening. But it was just a strange um Archer kind of realizing what's going on, and I don't think that that's really deserved. I think like your idea about Trip figuring it out, Trip overhearing something, is probably the more interesting way to go about that than Archer just magically being correct about it. Or, or I mean, you know, since since Archer is is since they've they've portrayed the humans as uh, suspicious of the Vulcans, you know, overall already. Um, the other way you could go, because I'm not sure what her standing is in the story, is I don't I don't know if T'Pol knows that this thing is down there. Seems it to seems, not know. Yeah, yeah. And so w- another way to play it that would be interesting would to have Archer be suspect of the Vulcans as he is wont to be, and have T'Pol go for go to bat for the Vulcans and be like, no, obviously that's not what's going on here. You're just being a prejudiced, blah 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 blah. And then the reveal have at the, at the end the reveal then has. Uh, Proves Archer's cynicism to be correct, but also uh, is damaging to to to, to Paul because her uh, idea of her elevated um, perception of her own people is now shattered because she doesn't she didn't realize this was going on. Yeah, yeah, and you, like, you, that would be kind of that would be kind of fun too. You think that they're kind of hinting at that through the flocks scene with her, where mm-hmm. he's he's doing a sort of friendly challenge of her beliefs, and that would tie into the conclusion in that case that. Um, Archer is more of a sort of uh, violent conflict of that of that mm-hmm. belief. Yeah, it's. I I think that I think you haven't really 
I don't think you have a great sense of T'Pol at this point. No, she kind of disappears. Yeah, and she's very secondary and things like this, and you think that she should be more um, integral to communicating between the humans and the Vulcans at this point, mm. but they, humans and Vulcans seem, seem to have no problem communicating with each other, and so she's unnecessary in a lot of ways. Um, I think that's it. We'll take a break, play a quote from this episode, come back, read some patron thoughts, and give our final thoughts about the Andorian incident. Violence in a sanctuary, Captain. Very disrespectful. Boy, did it feel good. All this time, they've been calling these monks liars, and all this time, they've been right. They've got enough equipment down there to see what any Andorian is having for breakfast. They've completed my scans. Give it to him. Sir. Give it to him. Thank you very much for supporting the show. Thank you for listening to the show, first and foremost. And if you want to support the show, you can go to patreon.com slash the Penske file. It's the best way to do it. A couple dollars a month gets you extra podcasts and things like that. We'll be talking about Brightburn this month, the uh, superhero, alien, violent, scary movie. Uh, and then we'll, I'll be doing a um, maybe a special event for the patrons, which I won't say anything until that actually happens, but we'll see or a special uh, recording. We'll see if that, that goes, but you can keep your eyes open for that. And as always... Our Captain Tier supporters get a shout out. Special thanks go to Andrew Cherlog, Ben Douglas, Captain Brazen, Cardinal Doomsday, Chris Tinsley, Christian Michaels, Christian Pouch, Darth Moss, David Beermore, David K, Dwayne Hackett, Eric Johnson, HH28, Jacob123, Jake Keys Gamer, Joint Mango, Jordan Cooper, Kevin Reyes, Cal Barrett, Mad Courier 6, Matt Cutler, Matt Houston, Matt Ross, Mike Burnett, Nathan Elliott, Neil Brennan, Nick Sergi, Robert Cummins, Russell Oates, Emmy Custer, Grim Santos, Sean, Stefan Minton, Tarik Latif, Tom Howells, Vault 13 Hero. Thank you very much. You are all the Andorians and Vulcans of our heart. And thank you for supporting the show. <laughs> All right. So fight amongst yourselves. Fight amongst ourselves. That's what the Discord is for. Um, patron comments at this point. If you're a patron, you can leave your thoughts about upcoming episodes and we read them. Matt Ross says, The Andorian incident, arguably one of Jeffrey Combs' best characters, is Shran of the Imperial Guard. It's wild to see the antenna of the Andorians moving. The story of animosity between the Vulcans and the Andorians is perfect for this series, and it shows how the pink skins, a.k.a. humans, will be the bridge between two rivals. It was funny to hear about the Vulcans think how humans smell and about T'Pol's numbing agent. The Vulcan monks are even more arrogant than usual. A pattern seems to start here in that Archer keeps getting beat up while the rest of the crew finds answers to the current situation. Another issue is that you think that the communication protocols and security concerns, as Reed mentions, would have been addressed for the deep space mission into the unknown. Reg uh, regardless, despite this anticlimactic and obvious reveal at the end, it was a fun adventure we didn't talk about the smell thing what did you think about the smell runner i thought that was pretty good yeah, yeah i like it, that yeah it's um i don't mind it i, I think that they yeah i, I do i just i did i love how casually it comes up in conversation where it where she's like uh or the guy's like uh, uh how could you deal with the smell and she's like well it's not that bad and also i have a numbing agent that keeps yeah. it out <laughs> also i take drugs yeah. <laughs> is mm, yes uh, it's an, is um, your response to a smell would be an emotion, right? It would have to be. Uh, so I guess it's it's interesting that the Vulcans care about it. Maybe they they don't care and are just kind of bringing it up as a matter of fact thing. But uh, she uses it as an excuse to not get into Archer's sleeping bag too. So they are also. I mean, you could argue that they are avoiding they are avoiding it by using this the numbing smell. Therefore, they are not having emotional reaction to it. Right, but they are do if they were because they're having to use the numbing agent, they must be having a disgust response to it, right? Yeah, that's true. Yeah, this show's stupid. They should, <laughs> they should, they should be more in control of their emotions. Point extra G says. So the Vulcans aren't just dicks to humans. They're dicks to everyone. Archer and Trip wanting to see the monastery is odd. It just doesn't strike me as something they'd be interested in. The ending just comes out of the blue, and it really isn't all that surprising. But it does give us Jeffrey Combs in his 147th Star Trek role. I think seeing the uh, Trip and Archer wanting to see stuff makes sense to me. They're, 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 yeah, they're, I think they're, so. I get the sense they're kind of bored out there, and they um, they want to prove the Vulcans I mean, wrong. It is, it is the... Uh, uh, the entire history of human exploration is, oh, what's that thing we don't know about? I don't know. Let's go ruin it. Yeah. What's the, what's the Edmund Hillary thing? Why did he climb Everest to see? What's his response? Because because uh, it was there. Why did why did you climb yeah. Everest? Because it was there. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. 
Uh, let's see. Next comment is David B. One of the best episodes of the first season. I thought it was effective to show the darker side of Vulcans and not make them out to be some kind of evil villain. Shran was honestly a bit annoying for me in this episode, but it gets better as time goes on. Solid twist on the generic crew is taken hostage by aliens plot. Yeah, I don't know. It, it's I don't know if I feel like it's a solid twist on that because it's kind of not. On the it's hostage kinda, situation, yeah. Yeah, it, it I don't know. If I you consider the ending that... to be a, a twist on that situation, I think it's a fairly stock situation with a twist. With a, It's not a twist ending, but with an ending that um, changes things a little bit for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. I, I think uh, it's not to say that I, I hate this episode or anything because I don't. I, I think it's fine. And I think it's a testament to the show that as I was as I was watching it, I, I was again thinking, man, they just put these shows together pretty really well. Like there's there's nothing that seems technically lacking, or it just it's the it the production of the show is firing on all fo- on all cylinders. But I do still think it is very much in that workmanlike manner where they're doing a good job with what they have, but what they have is it's like it's like they're just they're just getting the job done. It's not. It's not really raising the bar or anything as far as stories go. Yeah, I mean, I would I would say that the defining thing of Enterprise to this point is that in order to create those kind of solid, non-complicated, um, perfectly functional episodes like the ones that we've seen to this point, they've had to rely on stock storytelling at the expense of really developing characters in a lot of ways. Yeah. Like they... The, the characters feel like they have a bit of a personality, but in order for the stories to make sense, they're going with sort of a tried and true classic storytelling structure. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. what that does is it kind of blocks out the need for you to add really, as we said before, like there's no personality to the show yet. It's just there. Right. They have these characters they've created and they've stuck them in, into episodes that you're kind of fam- uh, familiar with to this point. And... That's why they work, because it's like a tried and true thing that people know this is going to work when it comes out, but it's not really yeah. inspiring as a new show. Yeah, and I think they're kind of missing – I think they're missing the opportunity to push the boundaries a little bit character-wise, because you can do that. You can – if you can get away with stock storytelling stuff if it's just sort of like a framing device or or the, the uh, delivery method for you really leaning into characters. Yep. You know? And they haven't really done that yet. Um, you get you yeah. get bits and pieces of it, but it's not it, it's not enough to to make it f- to make the um, overly familiar methods that they're using uh, not feel kind of uh, uh, well worn territory. Nick Sergey says, after a few episodes that were fairly good, but somewhat of a chore to get through, this episode comes through like a breath of fresh air. Sometimes people pointing guns at each other allows for good, straightforward storytelling and adventure, and we need some of that. I love this episode. The whole idea of human smells being too awful got a bit old by the uh, the end point, but the episode otherwise is very well done. The set design, the Vulcan guest characters, and the enduring characters all work in spades. I also like the strange music featured here, and I enjoy re-watching this episode. I would... I wish it at, at the uh, there was a point where um, Archer blew up it to Paul, and then at the end he was like, "And for the record, you guys smell too, and I don't say anything." <laughs> <laughs> Who doesn't smell? I've been working out. He's been playing a lot of water polo. Yeah, yeah. It's um, with the Vulcans. I mean, I guess the Vulcans would clean themselves. I was just trying to think if there's some some sort of flaw that the Vulcans would have to themselves, but it seems not to be that way. Uh, Stefan Minton says, For me, this is where Enterprise showed its full potential for the first time. It's not so much the plot itself, which is pretty standard fare. After all, Star Trek has done the crew members get taken hostage and need to be rescued story numerous times. But this episode is an early example of the two things that Enterprise was really good at. First, exploring some of the races that didn't get as much attention in the previous series, the Andorians here, obviously. But over the course of Enterprise, we learn more about them more than ever before about the Vulcans as well. And second, telling an interesting story about how a bunch of beings who behave like assholes manage to get their shit together, overcome their prejudices, and eventually form the Harmonious Federation. It's not all gold, but the creators clearly had an idea about what to make a prequel series, what would make a prequel series compelling and justify its existence, something the creators of Disco have never really managed to figure out. I thoroughly enjoyed this one, if only in the context of what's still to come. Four icons perched at an odd angle out of five. <laughs> uh, duh, duh, duh. 
Thomas Darnell says, I'm really glad you guys are doing Enterprise, which I think is an underrated series. For the Andorian incident, I love the turn that lasts throughout the series of the Andorians being slightly more reliable allies than the Vulcans. More trustworthy, but also more erratic. Enterprise was a little hard on Vulcans, but I think Strand was happier to see DePaul forced to follow Archer's order than he was to get the evidence. Uh, sorry, and then he, he goes into another episode there. So thank you, Thomas. And then... Uh, Matt Cabanus Adley says, one of my favorite Enterprise episodes, Reed in particular stands out without a ton of screen time, despite the focus being on the away team and the astounding Jeffrey Combs. To Paul straight up stealing the blanket from Archer for herself made me laugh too. Archer had no room at all by the end of that scene. The, I think the pro- my biggest problem with this sh- show so far is everybody on the Enterprise has two names. That yes, are like either first names or nicknames. Yep, they have so double they called- double. For they, well, I, I guess it's only Malcolm Reed, but the uh, someone's always made the point like you can't trust anybody who has two first names for their yeah. their name. Yeah, but you've got. I mean, Archer is Archer, so obviously I have no problem with that. But you've got Trip, who is also referred to as Travis, and then you've got M- Malcolm, who no is Trip also is re- Trip is. I'm uh, sorry, uh, he's Tucker. got another name, Tucker. Tucker yes. And then you've got Malcolm Reed, who they refer to by both names. Yeah. Uh, Travis, I don't know what his last name is. <laughs> Mayweather. So maybe Mayweather? Yeah, yeah Mayweather. I think they probably use both of those. So uh, it's it's very confusing for me who has problems remembering single names. Yeah, I mean, it's not just like, I, I think by the end of this, you're like, Mayweather has potential to be the worst Star Trek character of all time. He, oh, he he really doesn't do anything beyond what he's done to this point. So like yeah. you've, you've pretty much seen the extent of what that character can do. But I but don't I have to uh, love him wholeheartedly like all of the unnamed crew members of Discovery? Yes, you should. If you <laughs> if you if you don't know his name, it's obviously something something's gone horribly wrong. Yeah, Travis Mayweather, and then um, what's Archer's first name? There's another quiz for you. Archer's first name is Tom. Jonathan. Da. Jonathan Archer. And then uh, Hoshi Sato is the, the last character. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, Kyle Barrett says, this is the final comment. It was a pleasure to see one of my favorite DS9 performers return now with a new look. That's right. The big cog door returns with a fresh coat of paint. Jeffrey Combs is great, too, of course, and this is pretty good. In, oh, sorry, I screwed up the, the timing on that joke. Jeffrey Go- Combs is great, too, of course, and this is a pretty good introduction to Shran, although I wish he had a little more to do. It's a strong early episode that expands the human-Vulcan conflict to the rest of the quadrant, while also just being a fun but quite simple hostage crisis story. It's noticeably well-directed, too. I'm hoping you guys can explain to me why Archer got himself beat up just to throw a statuette through a big face on the wall when he could have just gone around to the back to peep through the eye hole to confirm the location. But even without that making sense, this is one of the best episodes of the show so far. I love the T'Pol and Flocks scene at the beginning as well. Um, yes, I, uh, the T'Pol and Flocks is my second favorite scene. I do like the Archer mm. and T'Pol scene is my favorite kind of thing. But no, yeah. I, I can't explain why he threw the statuette down that, that hole. It doesn't make any sense. Because he's because he's a bad captain. I mean... The, the the stock way that would work, right, is that he steals a communicator or something and throws it down the hole to the people who are on the oh, other side sure. of the wall, you know? Yes, yeah, 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 something like that, yeah. Uh, yeah, or or he or they they discover that knocking something down there leads into the, the, cat, the catacombs by accident. Oh, right, like he doesn't realize it at first, yes. And then, right, and when they're exploring the tunnels, they find it down there and they're like, wait a minute. Exactly, yeah. like yeah. the the idol that was pitched at a weird angle or something. The first time Archer gets beat up, he knocks into that and it falls into the mouth of the hole or something. Yeah. Yeah. And then when they go to the catacombs, they're like, wait a minute, wasn't this from the main sanctuary room? Yeah, wasn't this that totem that was a, at a peculiar angle? You know, I also noticed at the top of the stairs was uh, a face-looking thing. <laughs> Where have I seen a giant face before? They didn't uh, credit Olmec uh, as the the face on that wall. Which was <laughs> Purple monkeys. What are the blue blue barracudas? Those are the Andorians. Um, let's see here. We're done. Thank you, patrons, for leaving your comments about the Andorian incident. Clay, what do you give, mm. give this episode on a scale of one to five? Um, I'm going to give it a three. It's... Again, right down the middle. Uh, I I continue to think. I I will say that, like I, I did I did already kind of say, but uh, the the small stuff is where this where the series shines so far, and I think that they are are doing more of that. 
but still not enough for it to really be the stuff that carries the episodes because they're kind of doing them in, in a vacuum. It's like they do these really great small scenes, but the stuff that ties it together feels very just kind of stock. So it has they haven't synthesized everything to really make a, a, a great episode for me yet. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'd agree. It's a, um, it's a three for me. It doesn't have the uh, semi-controversial thing of unexpected, but I thought that unexpected was like a interesting... Uh, Unexpected is my favorite so far, and it's just because it was kind of like an unusual episode for this franchise, mm-hmm. I think. Mm-hmm. Um, this is much more stock, and I think that the the enjoyment probably potentially just comes from the fact that the Andorians are seen for the first, not seen, but are sort of introduced in canon for the first time here, and it, that's not really enough for me to carry the episode, mm-hmm. unfortunately. Uh, but I do like their antenna. Their antenna have come a long way from the TOS <laughs> yes. version. Yeah. Let's see. I think that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you guys for listening. Patreon.com slash the Penske file if you want to support the show. It's much appreciated. And otherwise, all the other stuff will be up on YouTube. Blah, blah, blah. All that good stuff. I don't think I have anything else here really to talk about. No. Enterprise continues. Uh, Real Ripe will be back at some point, And there will be YouTube stuff going up. Try to do a Jackbox session with the patrons. You can join the Discord, uh, which is a good thing to do if you want to get all this sort of like stuff that I don't post on Patreon. It's a good idea to do that. I think that's it. Clay, do you have anything you want to say? Um, new episode of Real, uh, Real... No, what the hell's the podcast I do? Rotten Horror Picture Show. Uh, it should be out. Just came out. Uh, it's Ginger Snaps. So check that out. And uh, Badass will be back relatively soon. Yep. Ginger Snaps is out. You can go to thepenskefile.com. Uh, I think that's pretty much it. What's the next uh, Rotten Horror? You said it in the... Um, it's your the Innkeepers. Innkeepers, yes. Ty West's The Innkeepers. It's our next... It's our second uh, wild card. So yep. it's our 10th episode, so it's our second wild card episode. So we're doing... Uh, Amanda has picked Ty West's The Innkeepers, which uh, is a really... I think is a really great movie mm-hmm. um, that doesn't get enough uh, credit. I don't think I've heard of it. I don't think so. Maybe I have. That's a semi. It's a semi generic title for a horror movie, actually. Yeah, um, it's it's a really under the under the radar kind of movie, and it's it's like the uh, quintessential modern indie horror movie where you've probably seen seen the the little icon for it on Netflix or uh, Amazon Prime a million times, yep. but you never clicked on it. And it's a very slow burn movie that if you're not ready for it and you're not like willing to, if you're not if you're not prepared for that sort of movie, you're going to think it's extremely boring. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. Run Horror is at thepenskefile.com. You can find all the shows there. I think that's it. We're done. Uh, the next episode after this one is, I'm going to click the button. It is Breaking the Ice. It's a good, solid title for something. <laughs> so we'll be back <laughs> with uh, the next Star Trek Enterprise episode. Let us know what you thought about that episode by clicking down below, leaving a comment. You can write an email, all that stuff. I think we're done. All right, guys. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you for supporting the show. We'll see you next time.